Hello, everyone, and welcome to the monthly Women's Summit meeting. My name is Ginger Watley, and I will be moderating today's call. We have a great speaker today, and we'll turn the presentation over to her in just a minute. But first, I want to go over the web conference instructions. Everyone is currently on mute, so that background noise does not become distracting for our other participants. To view today's presentations as the screens change live, please use the link that was sent to you in your email yesterday. Also in there, click anywhere on the page. If you click on the page, you'll see a pop-up option to make a comment. Feel free to ask questions by clicking on any slide and we'll make sure to get your questions answered. If you want to test it now, click on the screen and type in your favorite show that you binge watched during the year. I'm also looking for some suggestions. So for the newer participants in this group, it might be useful to review some of the benefits that you can take advantage of as a member at no additional charge. First, there are a lot of web conference meetings, one of which you're dialed into today. We hope you find these useful, and we have an excellent lineup, which you can see by going to our website schedule page. Second, we record all of these, so if you're traveling or stuck in another meeting, just log on at your leisure, and the full archives of past meetings are available to you with a number of interesting topics. Third, we want to get you to know other members. By logging in, you can see their profiles, and we're glad to make any introductions if wished. All of our members are looking to become outperformers and learn from each other. And also, if you're wrestling with any key issues or decisions, we strongly encourage you to reach out to the other members on the site. And it makes it, the site makes it easy to post questions. You'll find that the experience of your fellow members makes us a great forum to get advice from others who might have dealt with the same issues and probably can give you wonderful advice on what worked and what didn't. We're also generating executive summaries from each meeting. They'll be their key takeaways and learning nuggets so that you can reference them after the meeting and put them into action. Also, we know our members are very busy, so we started a service where we pick out six of the most interesting articles among thousands of articles at hundreds of sites to keep you abreast and make sure you didn't miss the key ones. And last, we have a book of the month summary that you can either listen to or Listen to as you commute or read the book. Each month we'll be selecting the most interesting book and then summarizing the ideas so with, in minutes you can absorb the key takeaways. There are many other benefits, but we just wanted to highlight some of them to keep for, for you to look out for each month. So that takes care of all the housekeeping items for today. So today our keynote speaker is Gianna Drake. Gianna Drake Carrison. Gianna Drake. Garrison is, the financial, is a financial advisor for a select group of successful women in transition and has developed and refined a process that puts in all the pieces of their, their evolving life puzzle together. She calls it retire or rewire. That is the ROR formula. Since starting the, finan since starting the financial services in 1984, Gianna has provided patient, proactive, and calm guidance to her clients through the bull and bear markets, recessions, market corrections, and the dot-com and housing bubble. She earned her business degree from Pace University in New York and is a certified retirement planning consultant. So Gianna, we are excited to have you today. Thank you for being with us. And I'm going to switch to your slides. So you just switch, you just tell me next slide and and I'll leave that I'll give you the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Ginger. I really appreciate it. Thanks again so much for inviting me to speak today. Um, one of the interesting thing about the raw formula, which is retire or rewire, is that all my clients are unique line muted personalities. They aspire to secure a family investment legacy. They want to retire and not outlive their money, uh, their money, and you know really want to maintain that what's called work optional lifestyle. And they all have a bucket list, and they look to the future with anticipation. And money is a means to that. So every client that I speak to, we either talk about retirement and how do we get there, or we talk about the critical life event that has happened in their life. They've sold a business, they've gotten divorced, they've become a widow, they've received an inheritance, they've been recruited. These are what we call game changers. And I really created this rural formula after my own critical life event where my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. You know, here I was, a wife, a mother, a daughter, only child, and a businesswoman, and I was really trying to figure out how to manage the many directions and challenges in my life. And I know that there are others out there like me. So that's um, how the rural formula and the creation of that uh, process came about. So I'm excited to share with you today about owning, owning your worth. And if you can change to the next slide, Ginger, that would be great. 
Um, uh, but I have this little story that I want to tell you. I, I've, I've said this, told this little story a, a few times, but there might be some folks out there that have never heard it before. But I have to talk about Paulina Proskova. She's actually done a couple of presentations here at UBS. Um, but you know, my husband and I have this little routine on Sunday morning. We read our papers, enjoy our coffee, and while watching, you know, that classic CBS Sunday morning show. And there was Paulina uh, in early 2020, and we sat there and watched her tell the story of how she, while she's considered to be one of the most beautiful women in the world, she talked about how her husband, Rick Kasich of the Cars, cut her out of the will, despite being married for over 30 years. And she shared with us, you know, I, I, I took it really personally because I was just like, what? And she shared her hurts and her sense of betrayal to the audience. And she also shared how she completely abdicated her financial role in the marriage. And, you know, they pretty much, pretty much both did. They, you know, had the business, uh, business managers. They had the CPAs, the whole thing. But now she is paying a high price for that abdication. And all the money that she earned as a model before and after the marriage is now gone. So uh, it's a, it's, it's the, you know, with that information and understanding, UBS a number of years ago um, did some extensive research. And if you could switch to the, to the next slide, please. Um, UBS did some extensive research on the topic of women and wealth. Um, it's been a challenge over the years, but we wanted to explore how women approach financial decision making in their own lives and their households. And we really spoke to widowed women, divorced women, married women, and both heterosexual and same-sex couples, and single women. And what we found was that many widowed and divorced women had regrets about not being able to, you know, not being involved in their financial lives, uh, not being able to and, and truly enjoy their new journey as, you know, as a single, as a divorced or widowed woman. And they didn't. Uh, you know, they regret just not being involved and would advise other women to take more of an active role in their financial lives now. So, and what we also discovered is that over half of married women in traditional heterosexual relationships said they defer or abdicate the major long-term financial de decisions and, and, and the investing decisions uh, to a male spouse or a partner. And these long-term decisions include financial planning, investing, insurance, and others. You know, we, I think many times we take on the role of budgeting, right? We, women are cooking the meals when they get home. Most women are doing that, taking care of the kids, you know, the whole nesting situation. And so we know that we do the budget, but it's those longer-term decisions that are really important. But what we also found out about single women, these brave, you know, single women that are out there today that feel as though they're, you know, um, are the new generation of women who are bold and confident, they even feel less confident about these major financial decisions than single men. So what's really holding women back? Married women rely on their spouses to make this, the, these decisions. Younger single women feel the implications of long-term decisions are just, hey, it's too far off. I don't have to worry about that. I have a long life to live, right? And the most common trend we hear is that many of us believe we have to be financial experts to participate in long-term finances. And that is so far from the truth. It really is. Next slide, please. The misperception persists that you need to be a financial expert in all financial matters and to be involved in any financial matters. Uh, you, you don't have to follow the market. You don't have to read the financial newspapers or watch financial television to have a meaningful conversation about your own financial situation and what you want your wealth to do for you uh, or what you want your money to do for you. But this mis misperception doesn't exist anywhere else. And I'll explain with a few analogies. Next slide, please. I don't know if there's a lot of folks out there that are runners like me, but did I have to study anatomy before going on, on a jog when I first started running? You know, do I need to know all the muscles that are being used and how it affects my body? It's not required to benefit from jogging or exercise or to stay healthy. And we know the benefits of exercise. Next slide, please. What about nutrition? Do you need to study nutrition to know that it's a good, good idea to order a kale salad as a healthy lunch option? No. We don't. 
uh, you know, we know that food, especially fruits and vegetables, are healthy for us without being experts in nutrition. And even to hire a lawyer to seek out le legal advice. You don't have to, you know, read a, a, a dense legal textbook before calling a lawyer for a legal consultation or a conversation. So the fact is you don't need to learn everything, and I would dare say anything about finances before getting involved in your own financial life either. All you really need to know is what's most important to you. There are lots of easy ways to get involved and small steps you can take at a t one at a time to really get comfortable and as you get more comfortable and you get more involved, you'll be able to uh, see that you'll be able to do, do even more. So, and, and what happens, right? The more you do, the better your financial life will be. And we all can agree that financial well-being and security really supports our overall well-being. And they, those two are really, you know, very linked. Next slide, please. So let's get started because we want to talk about 10 different ways that you can, you know, ease your way into taking action and to own your worth and be more involved in your financial life. There are a lot of ways you can get involved because becoming more secure in your financial future and getting on the path towards your financial goals, you know, is, is so um, a load off your shoulders, right? It's, it's just uh, expansive and inspirational. And you know what? You'd be surprised. I'm, I know that so many of you are already doing some of them. But let's kind of start our conversation or our talking about the 10 ways and then list key ways to participate in, um, um, you know, how you can really participate in working with an individual or talking with your, um, your spouse or partner on um, ways of owning your worth and really understanding about finances. So we called a dozen of convers dozens of conversations with women, financial advisors, UBS financial advisors, and other financial experts. And um, there, I'll give you some tips to also introduce you to some ways UBS could kind of help you on your journey. And I'll, uh, the next slide will uh, will get us there. Uh, in front of you um, should be a website. If you're not able to visually see, don't worry, but you don't have to take notes because everything you'll dis we'll discuss today can be found on our website. So if you write down anything, one of the things I do want you to write down is this website, ubs.com forward slash my money move. Again, ubs.com forward slash my money move. And there's a lot of content that's there that uh, will give you some real good information, there's videos, tools, and checklists, and all kinds of good stuff, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the presentation. Let's move forward. Next slide, it should be topic number one, which is keeping dreaming your dreams. Keep dreaming your dreams. Um, your dreams don't have to be about long-term, like buying a vacation home or starting a philanthropic foundation or, you know, anything like that. Your dreams can be shorter like, you know, taking a two-trip around the world, two-week trip around the world, or making some sort of minor home improvement, right? It, it can be short. Or even just, let me get started on a budget, right? <laughs> That's one of the ways to do that. So dreaming is part of financial planning, and when we have these discussions, it's, it's really about thinking about these things, what you want for the long term, what do you want for the short term, and what do you want for longer, you know, for beyond, is really the foundation of, you know, set goal setting and, and help you decide what your money, what you want your money to do for you. So we find at UBS, we find it, it to be helpful to organize your financial life across three key strategies, liquidity, longevity, and legacy. And it's a good idea to think about your wealth and what you want your life across these three strategies. In fact, 80% of the women that we spoke to around the country thought this approach really, really made sense. Liquidity, longevity, and legacy. Liquidity, next slide please. Liquidity is about things you may need in the um, short term. So let's say like the next three years. Maintaining your lifestyle, enjoying travel, entertainment, even purchasing a home could be in the short term category and the short term dream or goal that you have. Longevity strategies are longer term needs let's say four years or more, through your lifetime, and include how you would prepare for retirement, how you might plan for um, <clears throat> excuse me, unforeseen medical costs, 
or even buying your dream second home at the beach or in the mountains or whatever. So there's a lot to think about when you dream about you know, longevity. And then finally, legacy represents helping others now as well as, in the, you know, as well as going beyond your own lifetime, right? It's like gifting to your family, a loved one, or a, fa a, a, a nonprofit organization that you are very, very passionate about. Next slide. Let's take dreaming and planning for the future to the next level. We have this financial dream kickstart guide, and it, you will find it on that website. And um, you know, all you need to, to be involved, as I mentioned before, financially, is to know what is important to you. So let's think about this. And if you have a moment, you know, you don't need to write these down, but they're on the website. But these are the questions that I use in order to really jumpstart conversations about planning and goals. What do you want to accomplish in your life? What are your main concerns? What do you want your legacy to be? Who are the people that matter most to you? And how do you plan to achieve your life's vision? These are the five questions that are just begin the beginning of what we call the UBS Wealthway. And it's a process that we use to help clients on their financial journey. Next slide. Making your mark is number two. As I mentioned, the concept of legacy, maybe part of your legacy is leaving a world that's better for others or gifting money to children or loved ones. The good news is that you don't have to really wait until you're gone to really help others or to really establish your legacy. You can do that starting now. And investing your money in the right place now while keep in mind, you know, keeping in mind all your life goals or what you want to do during that time can really help you achieve your legacy aspirations. And if you have a partner, a spouse, you want to align you know, what impact you want to make. You want to do that together. Next slide. So the best way to do this is really having a conversation, right? You want to stay focused on sharing how you feel Listening to what your partner feels is, most, is important as well, but if you two of you differ, you really can split the difference between the two. If you're not in a partnership or in a marriage, it can be helpful to have that conversation with an advisor or a trusted peer or a loved one, right? And these topics that are on the slide here are topics for both now and in the future, right? You know, who do you want to receive your wealth if you're no longer able to enjoy it? Who are the most important people in your lives and how should your wealth be divided amongst them, and is giving while living important to you, right? And the, the other two are there as well, you know, leaning anything to the causes that you care about and put limits on, on your inheritance. You want to put limits on the inheritance as well. Next slide. Number three, knowing your net worth. A very important area to focus on is to look at your financial situation and calculate your net worth. It's hard to know what you can do with your money or what goals you can accomplish if you have no sense of, you know, the full financial picture or how much money you have. Sometimes it's daunting and scary to even do this, but it, it is a step that, one of the steps that you need to do. And your net worth is more than just your investments and your savings. You have to factor in your debt, um, like car loans or mortgages. So put it simply, your net worth is the sum of what you own, your assets, minus what you owe, your debt, uh, also known as your liabilities. Now slide number, uh, the next slide please. Um, so let me kind of walk, walk you through an example of how you can easily determine your net worth. And this is a hypothetical couple and you know, they've, uh, um, uh, they have uh, own, uh, amassed a nice amount of money together. Uh, but Nancy and her husband have about a million dollars in, uh, in their investment, retirement, and banking accounts together. Um, in their case, their retirement accounts are, you know, their, their company 401k. That's usually, other than your home, a really good sense of what your net worth is. Uh, and they have investment bank accounts with UBS as well. They have a home that's worth about 750. And Nancy and her husband, they also bought a second home that's worth about $400,000. And then they estimate that their other valuable belongings, jewelry, they have a boat, 
you know, worth about $100,000. And those other items could be valuables like art, furniture, vintage items, you know, equipment, cars, and so on. And now the debt. They bought that vacation home and they have a mortgage on it. They still owe about $200,000 on the uh, outstanding mortgage. And additionally, they have about $150,000 credit line that allows them to kind of borrow using, you know, eligible securities as well. So when you minus the debt, right, the assets minus the debt, you to calculate their net worth. And I've seen a husband simply take all their assets minus their debt, and then, you know, your net worth is always changing. So it's always good to really kind of uh, exercise uh, an opportunity to review this on, on a regular basis, right? And, you know, you don't have to go digging through all these files to, or statements to really have an exact appraisal of all your assets. As long as it's in the close range, it's really good enough to get started with that. Next slide. So let's talk about a topic that is uh, dear to my heart, spending. Uh, my husband as well. I'm a shoe girl. My husband loves art. That's kind of our, you know, our issue. But uh, we try to keep that under wraps. And so spending is really something you need to really, you know, put into a couple, three categories, right? And we, we put them into categories of what's needs, wants, and wishes. Shoes do not go into my need category, right? They, <laughs> they go into my wants and wishes category, depending on how many shoes I want to buy. But we like to view spending in those three categories. Um, UBS has a, a budgeting technique. It's called the 50-30-20 rule, right? Needs are your food, housing, child care, you know, utilities, and so on. Wants are entertainment, vacations, you know, clothing, um, club memberships, and, and wishes are charitable giving, you know, uh, second home gifts, and leaving money to loved ones and so on. So the 50-30-20 rule means aiming to have 50% of your money monthly budget go to needs, 30% um, on wants, and 20% on savings for your wishes, like that you know, big trip or you know, um, the, the beach home or the, the, the gifting. It will vary from month to month based on your life situation, but this is a good way to really get that started. And next slide is something that you will find on that website that I mentioned earlier. And it's a real simple worksheet where you can download and help, you know, to see, you know, where your money is coming from and where it's going. And it's really, you know, it's a cash flow uh, chart or, or sheet. There's two columns next to each topic. And the first one is where you write down where you, what you're actually spending. And the, uh, you know, uh, what you're spending every month and you want to kind of Go back a few months to kind of get an average of what you're spending. And then, you know, on the other side, where you, the second column is you write down the target amount you want to spend in each area. And you probably heard about this before, but budgeting can really be a great financial foundation for reaching your goals, regardless of your level of wealth, right? Budgeting ha does not have to be about limitations, and I'm really a stickler about that. I do want to have, want you to have fun, right? Um, but have a detailed budget. You know, having that really allows you to see how you can spend uh, and, and what you can afford to do. Next slide. Checking for cash. Um, developing a budget and keeping an eye on your spending and other ways to be involved in your finances is simply to hold cash or cash equivalents like money markets and um, savings accounts and checking accounts. So it's important to meet your short-term needs right? Um, and that falls into yet that liquidity strategy, right? Um, having some easily accessible funds, particularly when there are fluctuation, fluctuations, excuse, excuse me, is, is important. Maintaining that emergency fund is as important of planning as for the unexpected too. But holding too much cash can have its downside. And that could mean missing opportunity when you ha can have your money work harder for you in the markets to help you build towards your dream. And that takes us to the next slide, which is uh, about having too much cash, right? Um, this slide here is all about, you know, while cash is important, important asset, we do have this horrible thing called inflation, right? And historically, cash does not keep pace with the inflation of our economy. 
And so this means that the dollars and absolute terms you have today won't be able to purchase as much in the future. And we all know that. I mean, you go to the movies, right, 15, 20 years ago, it was, you know, seven seven fifty to go to a movie, and now it's like 15 bucks, right? It's just kind of insane. Uh, some things on this chart is a little bit, you know, I kind of laugh at, like the bread, right? I mean, I don't know. If I, if I buy Ezekiel, you know, uh, organic bread, that's almost 4 bucks, right? And, you know, I don't know where I can get bread for $1.28. <laughs> so um, I kind of look at this slide and kind of laugh a little bit. But anyway, so, you know, keeping more cash than you need really means that you'll have less spending power in the future due to inflation. So um, I wanted to kind of show you that in these slides. Next slide. I think it's important for people to know how much money is enough to follow your passions, achieve your goals, maintain your lifestyle, and really reach those dreams that, you know, we talked about earlier, right? So there's no magic number, and each and every one of us is different, and we have a different level of wealth that makes us feel comfortable. You know, in fact, 52% of working millionaires feel pressure to continue working to keep up their family's lifestyle. And many of us feel like we're on that treadmill, right, that treadmill uh, that just never seems to end. And, you know, you have to find out how much is enough for you. And doing a financial plan and using that Wealthway strategy, or even if you go on the, the website and start that Wealthway application, you really get a sense of how much is enough for you. Next slide. So to help you understand your enough, you have there's another guide. It's a you know that can help you, and the questions are here. If you um, can write them down, if not, they're all actually on the website as well. And and it's just some questions about you know do I have enough to sustain my lifestyle, and what is my updated net worth and asset allocation? So you have to do that net worth and review that. You know does my current budget align with my goals? Right to achieve your goals. Uh, are my values reflected in my individual fi financial plan? So that, that, so that financial plan is a living, breathing document in many respects. And am I saving enough in the right places to achieve my goals? So many of these topics, you know, touch upon some of the key areas we've already discussed today, like net worth and budgeting and savings. Uh, it can help to talk through these answers with your partner or spouse um, or with an advisor like myself. I can help you look at that situation and goals and calculate if you're on the right track or if you need to make some changes. So working with a partner really helps in tracking and developing a financial plan that lays out a real pathway toward achieving your life goals. Next slide. And you don't want to leave any loose ends, right? This, this young lady was smart. She's crossing the street. She's got an umbrella. She, you know, it started out as a sunny day. And she just happened to have an umbrella in her handbag. And she does it every morning when she goes to work. She throws an umbrella in her handbag, you know, the, quite the possibility of it's going to rain. And uh, that's sort of like, you know, planning for the future, right? Um, you really want to um, use, you may use it, you may not use it, but just, it's great to know that it's there. And that's really what a financial plan is really all about um, and having these difficult conversations uh, about um, planning for the future and so on. Um, few people want to think about illness or disability or death. Um, so leaving no loose, loose ends really protects the people you love just in case something happens to you or your partner and can really protect your assets and your legacy. Next slide. This is probably the most daunting financial to-do that I'll cover today, number seven, which is, you know, leaving no loose ends. But you really have to do this. It's the part of the conversation uh, to really have with, you know, your um, loved one. Um, yeah, a financial advisor can assist you with some of these concerns that are up there. An attorney can help you with the broader estate planning and last will and testament considerations. You know, together, you know, with these trusted advisors, you can help, they can help you clarify your wishes and create a plan that honors them. Um, there are many legal and financial documents that can help guide what happens in many of the situations that are listed there. So I'm happy to have a separate conversation with anyone about that unique situation, but what's important is to start thinking about ensuring you have the proper plan in place around things like will, power of attorney, a trust, life insurance, 
guardianship directions for minor children, those are really important. Those are loose ends, and you need to take care of those. And seeking professional guidance on these can really help. Next slide. Um, we've talked about a lot of strategies for you to, to think about your finances differently and to get more involved in ways that are more relevant to your financial situation, really owning your worth, right? So let's talk a little bit about making your money work as hard as you do, right? The, the sooner you put your money to work, the greater your potential is to building more wealth and taking advantage of the ways the markets can work for you. And by putting the money to work, I mean, you know, investing it, right? We've talked about how inflation can eat away at the purchasing power of cash, whereas investing that cash can help you build wealth over time and providing resources uh, over your lifetime. And since we know women tend to live longer than men, that means a longer period of time for which you need to be funded. Next slide. So I know investing may seem complicated, and there are a lot of options out there, but there's also a lot of noise, <laughs> and it's important to focus on you know, a few easily digestible steps to get started. I always say a good place to start is investing in your employer-sponsored 401k or IRA account if you work outside the home and you have these programs in place through your employer. If you have an employer-sponsored plan, a 401k, 403b, or whatever, you know, take a look at the investment options and educate yourself with the different types of funds. Many uh, 401k plans or employer-sponsored plans now offer what's called target date funds, which adjust the investments to, do redu to reduce the risk as you get closer to retirement. They're really wonderful. You know, be sure to consider diversifying your investments by purchasing various asset classes of stocks and bonds, right? Diversification basically means not putting all your eggs in one basket. So if there is a market fluctuation or a scenario that affects like, you know, what happened last year, um, the pandemic uh, um, scenario that happened last year, a crisis, pandemic crisis, you know, if, you, if there are market fluctuations or a scenario that affects, you know, one asset class, your entire portfolio is not affected by that, right? Um, so, you know, at least, if anything, you know, you want to ask for help. So anyone can invest on their own with enough time and interest for some people, and some people enjoy doing that, but not everyone, right? And so you want to reach out and, and you know, the advice of an advisor to help you talk through all of the options and the accompanying risks and benefits and how each option fits into a broader portfolio for you and for your goals. Next slide. So we've gone through about nine of the ten topics I sent out to, you know, to, I set out to discuss with you today. And the next topic is really about having conversations, about talking about money. And it's great that, you know, you, you came to this, to, to this webinar to discuss finances, especially considering that we all know money can be a taboo subject um, to discuss openly and a quick uh, Google search kind of shows the same, right? Talking to your partners or your friends or your family about money can be really tough. And it might feel weird or it might not feel comfortable. And research shows most families don't openly discuss it. We didn't discuss it in my family. But talking openly about money can, all, can be a really good thing, and it's, it, this is like a, a, a taboo that we really want to break. Just like we talk openly about our health, what we eat, what diet we're on, the doctors we visit, relationships, we need to really talk about our financial health. And it's really time to get more involved in talking just like, you know, what kind of I'm doing today. I'm talking. You guys aren't talking with me, but it, you, you get what, I am, what I'm saying. It's really having a conversation at home, and it's a, it's a great way to start. Our research actually shows that many men and women in the, US, in the U.S. wish it were easier to talk about money and would find it helpful if they could do so more openly. We just got to take the initiative and make that first step. Next slide. So how do you make that next step, right? Conversations are powerful, I want to say powerful money moves, right? And that can lead to really exciting moves between the two of you if there's a, a spouse or a, a partner. 
And on that website that I mentioned before, that Money Move website, they have some really great Money Talk icebreakers to really help you start the conversation uh, and, and, and the difficult conversation. And each one can be customized to kind of really help you, um, you know, create, have, start and, and, and have that conversation. And there, some of the topics are listed uh, up there on the slide there, but um, I hope you take a look at it and uh, get an idea of how you'd like to start having that conversation. Next slide. And finding support, slide number 10. I know uh, thinking about all these topics can be really hard and it's totally understandable and it's sort of like a, a mad rush of information that I'm sharing with you right now, but you don't have to address all of them at once. You know, any step to, you know, to think about, discuss, or take action on any of the topics we've covered today is a great money move and a step in the right direction. And you don't have to do it alone. Um, you can rely on experts, of course, to understand and guide us. And so, you know, you don't have to become experts in those fields. And so you don't have to become an expert in everything related to your finances. And that's the benefit of having a conversation with a financial advisor, someone like myself. Research shows that people who work with financial advisor accumulate wealth more quickly than those that don't work with advisors, right? We're sort of like that, we're that, we're that coach. I'm sure there's folks out there that have done some sort of coaching or executive coaching. A financial professional like myself can look at your total wealth picture, offer you objective advice, and help you fill in the gaps. So what you can expect from working with someone like myself is n no one knows your own life better than you. And so having that conversation, you, you know, a, uh, an advisor can help you define your goals, time horizon, risk tolerance, and take those inputs as well as your net worth, like I mentioned earlier, and create what's called a comprehensive financial plan and help you discuss a lot of the other topics as well. Uh, next slide. So you may recall that I mentioned that UBS Wealthway earlier um, as a way to help you on your financial journey. It's, it's a five-step process that brings, you, you, uh, to, brings together a, a lot of what I shared in this uh, presentation with the goal of helping you pursue what really matters most to you. We start with discovery asking questions that help uncover what's important to you. Then we organize your wealth into the three key dimensions that I mentioned earlier, right? What were they? Liquidity, longevity, and legacy. And then we put it in a plan and carefully walk you through it. And then we have to put that plan in motion. It's not just, you know, set it and forget it, right? Life changes. Market shifts all the time. As I said, that plan is a living, breathing document. So together, you make any updates as circumstances change, right? Those game changers. We want to be prepared for those. And the wealth way can help you, help you, help really give you confidence about your future because you'll know where your money is and why. And the plan also helps you pursue the most important items for today, tomorrow, and for the future. Next slide. And on that wealth way, on that, sorry, that money management, uh, um, my, my, not money management, the My Money Move website, um, it, it, it has information about what's your money language, right? It's, it's, a, it's a money move quiz that's on the site, and I've taken it myself. And it's really to find out about your money language. And, um, you know, we know that, you know, one size doesn't fit all, and that goes, for your approach to financial planning as well. And so that's why the money, manage, money move quiz can help you get, um, kind of find your money language and give you ideas of where to get started. That's kind of what I'm trying to say here. Um, it'll only take you five minutes. It was easy to complete and it's not technical at all. It's meant to be fun and interactive. And after you've taken the quiz, you know, you'll get your results. And, you know, if you want to reach out or whatever, um, just kind of go over them. It'll be a lot of fun to kind of see what it is. But, for me, you know, I'm a very visual person, and I'm, I'm motivated by tangible goals. And so that's kind of what my money language is like. Uh, next slide. And so that brings us to the end, ladies. Um, thank you so much again for um, inviting me, and, and thank you again for your time today. I hope you found line unmuted valuable, and regardless of your level of engagement with your financial life, I really hope some of these topics have resonated with you. 
Um, I'm here to give you, help you give a, 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 a dive deeper in, into any of the topics we discussed today or to help start these conversations. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me at any time, talk about what's going on and, and to review any approach that could work for you. And, you know, thanks again. And I hope we have time for some questions. Um, there we go. Yes, we do have time for some questions. So first, oh, good. so first I want to see if anybody, I've got some questions in the chat. And for anybody else, please okay. type some questions into the live feedback. So, um, so I'm gonna, I'll start with one from the chat before I ask everybody to ask live questions. So our first question comes from Jennifer. And Jennifer says, mm -hmm. we're planning financial education for our children, starting with savings accounts and, and college money market accounts. What's the next best investment for their legacy funds for them to access about 10 to 15 years from now? Uh, well, it depends on the age of the child. If I'm, if I'm thinking they're trying to, you know, uh, wanting to do a, a kind of a, a wealth way version of a, a um, liquidity like a uh, um, uh, legacy type of uh, process for them as well, right? So um, one of the things I think that that's really great for longer term going out is that once they start a part-time job or anything like that is setting up a Roth IRA for them. I think that is really huge, doing a Roth. So if they, you know, if they're, uh, you know, um, uh, of age, uh, here in California, you know, our, uh, kids can start working at, at age 15, 16. And so if they start putting away $12 a month or $15 a month into a Roth IRA, you know, compounded over time, if they never touch it, they just continue to do it through the years that they're working, any little part-time job right up uh, until even when they're working and they have, uh, you know, as, as, as long as they fall into the income limits, uh, and they can, can can continue to contribute into a Roth IRA. Um, uh, it will really compound and grow amazingly fast uh, by starting some sort of Roth IRA and work, and contributing to that well into their working years as adults, uh, as long as they beat the income limits going going forward. So I, that would be one of my suggestions. Great. And before I'm going to ask. If we need to take live calls, I'm going to ask everyone to hit five star, and that will let me know to unmute you. So if anybody has any live call, if anybody ask, would like to ask a live question, please click five <laughs> star, and I can unmute you. And while we're doing that, my our next question comes from Audrey, and Audrey says, is there ever a situation where someone should not contribute to their company's 401k? as maybe in the return investment is too low and it might be better to put it into a different fund? Mm. Well, you know, the, uh, investing into the company 401k or, or company employer-sponsored plan gives you at least one of two benefits, right? One is that you get a deduction. Um, it's for savings because it's coming out of your paycheck. Um, and, and the, the, the other is that there is a possibility that hopefully the company is matching. Not every company matches, of course, but there may be a company match, so you're leaving money on the table, right? You're, 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 it's sort of like that great feeling you have when you put on your favorite pair of jeans and you found a $20 in the pocket, $20 bill in, in the pocket. It's like, oh, my God, this is, you know, where did this come from? Um, so, you know, you know, you you want to capture. You you jump ahead when you have a company match. But even if your company isn't matching, the company 401k is really systematic forced savings. Um, the advice I can give you on not sure regarding how the assets are invested is you really need to reach out to an advisor whether the company has should have a financial advisor connected to the plan that you can reach out to and get advice on how to invest the money. Most company 401k plans have target date funds. And so if you don't feel that the return is to your to the best or what you would like, then uh, I would go a little further out um, in, in, the, um, in the target date. Um, to kind of be a little, maybe a tad more aggressive, but I, I'm speaking out of turn because I don't know what your risk tolerance is like. So um, 
I, the 401k is really, that's the first step. I, I, I can't imagine working for a company. I, I regret, uh, just to throw my own two cents in there, that when I was in my early 20s that I didn't join my company 401k plan at that time um, because it really is for savings and really setting you up for a really great future. Outside of the 401k, it's hard outside the 401k. Um, you could do, outside, you know, set up an investment account. You can't do a traditional IRA. Uh, you can, but it will be non-deductible, right? Uh, because if you have a company-sponsored plan, uh, you can't deduct the IRA um, because of the, the fact the IRS says you have a company-sponsored plan and you should be investing in that plan first. But if you don't want to invest in that plan, then you could make a non-deductible contribution into a traditional IRA. Uh, you would control that. You'd be able to invest it how you see fit. And if income limits uh, work in your favor, um, you could do a Roth IRA as well. So oh, there you go. Thank you. Okay, so I unmuted, mm -hmm. I unmuted one person. So I'm hoping there's one person out there that wants to ask a live question. And now is your chance. Please ask a live question. Oh, we still have a shy, shy audience. So the next, <laughs> but we have lots of questions that came into the chat. So I'm excited to have that. Okay. So the next question, Great. next question comes from Lori, and Lori says, "When you get started early, how and where do you start when you have very little extra money?" So. Um... The idea to really understand, uh, there, are four, there are four stages of your financial life. And the key to really, you know, looking at your financial life and trying to get started, it all really starts with a budget, right? So if you are, um, you want to be, you know, there's, there's four stages. There's a surviving stage, a driving stage, and a arriving stage, and a thriving stage when I really think about people and, and where they are in life. And your surviving stage is, you know, where you, you may not be have a lot of extra money. You may have credit card debt. You may have, you know, uh, you don't have a budget, um, and you've got all these expenses, and, and you may not be working at a job that, you know, where it pays you a lot or you have a lot of expenses. So the idea is creating a plan for yourself so that you can identify where you have the extra money to invest. And there's a number of tools out now, like um, you know, there's Robin, where you can actually take a small amount of money and, and, and invest uh, in some of the exchange traded funds or in indexes, index funds like the S&P 500 and so on to help you. But what I would do is really start looking at my budget. I would look at my budget and really have a good sense of my expenses and what comes in and what comes out. And there's a great tool on, um, uh, if you Google, I think it's Versa 42, but if you do, if you Google um, budget, you know, you know uh, it comes up as an Excel spreadsheet, you know, budget template is what I do, and it comes up by versus 42, I believe it is. And it's there where you can put in what you earn and then every deduction for the entire month. And then when you see what's left at the end, that's where you can say, hey, I can invest and go to maybe Vanguard or um, um, one of the, you know, uh, Charles Schwab, and just a simple, you know, um, exchange traded fund, uh, S&P 500, you know, fund, um, ETF, where you can put in a small amount of money and start really slow. So that's one way where if you feel as though you don't have enough money, you can start. But the first step would be to do the budget. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, the mm -hmm. next question comes from Tammy. And Tammy says, my husband insists that Social Security will be available to us when we retire in 10 to 15 years. Do you think it will still be paying mm -hmm. out at that time? I do. Okay. <laughs> at, the, at the same rate that I we're do. considering? 
it may it it may change, um, and I think that what it may how it may change. Um, I don't have a crystal ball to know okay. emphatically, but what I I do know is that the trust the trust for Social Security is solvent. Um, it's solvent until 2035 or 34, I believe. Um, and it's solvent to 100%, and then I think it drops to about 75%. So if they're going to make any adjustments, they may change for you know, the, uh, the, uh, your full retirement age might change. It might change to, you know, from 67 to 68 to, to 69, or, you know, they may make some adjustments there so that um, it'll, it'll have more um, uh, legs to the, to the, to the Social Security. But uh, what I will tell you is that there are so many elderly, you know, individuals, uh, seniors in this country that depend and live and, and, and are part of Social Security. I don't see them, you know, I don't see it running out. Um, I see that they're going to make some adjustments to keep it solvent and keep it going. Right. It is solvent, Wonderful. that's for sure. Thank you. So mm -hmm. next question is from Tabitha. Tabitha asks, when determining net worth, should the spouse's asset and debt be considered as well? I'm sorry. So we repeat that again. You, uh, for, unfortunately, you cut out. When, so, when determining net, net worth, should the, okay. should the mm -hmm. spouse's asset and debt be considered as well? Yes. If you have a spouse, you want to look at the, the entire family. Um, as, we, as we showed in that other slide, it was assets of, of both spouses. Um, that were considered in determining uh, net worth. All the assets for the entire family, all the debt for the entire family equals your net worth. Great. All right, two more questions. So one is, this mm -hmm. is always a good one. My family and I find find the taboo, oh, I'm trying, let me reword it to say it like I would say it. My family and I don't like the risk and fees involved in investments. Can you please talk through a couple of kinds of low risk, low fee investments to start with so we feel more comfortable with our initial steps to making our money work? Sure, so low fee, low risk. So low fee would be looking at exchange traded funds. Those are better than your regular straight passive mutual funds where um, exchange traded funds are mutual funds, but they trade on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and so those are some of the lowest fees uh, around. Uh, and you can get those, you know, Vanguard has them, BlackRock has them. I mean, they're, they're just all over. Um, and, and they trade on the New York Stock Exchange. And whereas you know, the, the more common mutual funds, passive mutual funds, uh, those have you know, like an internal expense fee of like 1% or 2% or whatever. The exchange traded funds have a, a minimal, minimal uh, uh, internal expense fee. So that's, that's really uh, important uh, and a good way to go. As far as low risk, that would be a good idea for you to take a risk tolerance test. So, you know, the idea of low risk is the fact that you, the goal should be to try to beat inflation. And so, um, but I, I, I'm, what I'm getting is that they're looking to also protect their principal, right? So the idea would be trying to find investments that are what's considered conservative. And if you just simply Google or ask an advisor, um, you know, I, I can't, I, if anybody were to, to reach out to me and ask me a question like that, I would immediately just try to help show them by Googling, hey, you know, this is a conservative, low risk type of, you know, uh, and uh, exchange traded fund that you can look at and, and you know, kind of guide you through um, the steps of how you can invest in something like, like that through Charles Schwab or, you know, even at your local bank, right? Right. You can, get, if you, you can do it that way. So uh, an exchange traded fund and trying to take a risk tolerance test to really get a sense of what you're looking at under whether you're conservative, conservatively moderate, you know, moderate maybe, you know, uh, and then you can find a fund or a family of funds that can, to get, that can put you into that category. But I think you really do need an advisor to really kind of give you some advice on that. Great. Thank you. And this is our last question. Mm -hmm. Our last question mm -hmm. is, right, I just, 
It's from Carrie, and Carrie says, Great presentation with extremely helpful information. Do you have any book recommendations or website recommendations to provide additional information or guidance on strengthening personal finances? Uh, gosh, book recommendations. Um, hmm. Uh, oh God, uh, Jean Chatsky, she's really, really good. Um, she's on, uh, um, I think she's on CBS or, or on um, NBC. She is uh, Jean Chatsky. She really has some really good uh, materials and books on investing and also budgeting and also um, 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 uh, financial planning and so on. She's really, really good, Jean Chatsky. Um, there's a couple of others I, I, I wouldn't really recommend because I think they're a little bit too dramatic. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I do. Yeah. I, really, I, I like to keep the emotion out of investing, right. and, and that's one thing I, I would rather guy take you away from. So, yeah. But Jean Chasky is really good. I really like her. Well, we really appreciate it. I know we can all like ask you questions for hours and talk for hours because we all have questions and it's, and we all have a, and we're all going down different paths too. So we really appreciate mm -hmm. your time today. So before we um, before we finish, let me just say, do you have any final words of wisdom for our audience today? Yeah, I do. Uh, you know, as I, I kind of mentioned before about the four stages of your financial life: there's the surviving stage, driving, and stage and uh, arriving stage and thriving stage and if anybody wants to get in contact with me I can kind of talk to them in a little bit more detail about that but what I wanted to say was the best part of measuring success um, by you know this own your worth and this metric and doing the 10 steps is that everyone has the same chance of succeeding right it doesn't matter if your income is fifty thousand dollars a year or five hundred thousand dollars a year these requirements just need to be achieved by everyone. And, and, and so this puts everyone on the same playing field and leaves no room for excuses. It's like, you know, you can't think that, oh, that person has a half a million dollars and so it earns a half a million dollars a year and so they have better opportunity to do this. That's not true. They have, they have just as much, you know, emotional baggage when it comes to money as someone who earns, you know, fifty or sixty thousand dollars. The, the, these, the, the tools, the 10 steps are achievable not by income amount, by dedication and hard work. And that's really what uh, I'd like to advise. I'm trying to basically say that, you know, it, it works for everyone, not just someone who um, is what they think is, is wealthy. And so everyone has an opportunity here. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Gianna. Sure. And thank you to all our listeners as well. Without all of you, these events would not be possible. So let's continue wow. to support women's leadership and learn from one another. So to end, be, si be safe, be kind to yourselves, and be kind to each other, and be well. So until next time, this is Ginger Watley signing off. So have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. You've elected to end this conference. To confirm, press 1. To cancel, press 2.